Hello, my name is Glenn Siegel. I am the founding director of the Magic Triangle Jazz Series, a program of the Fine Arts Center. I'm also a co-founder with Priscilla Page of a community-based nonprofit called Pioneer Valley Jazz Shares. And it's my honor to be speaking with Jen Xu today. Jen Xu is a groundbreaking multilingual vocalist, composer, producer, multi-instrumentalist, dancer, 2019 Guggenheim Fellow, 2019 United States Artist Fellow, 2016 Doris Duke Artist, and was voted 2017 Downbeat Critics Poll Rising Star Female Vocalist. Born in Peoria, Illinois, to Taiwanese and East Timorese immigrant parents, Xu is widely regarded for her virtuosic singing and riveting stage presence carving out her own beyond category space in the art world. She has performed with such musical innovators as Nicole Mitchell, Anthony Braxton, Wadada Leo Smith, Steve Coleman, and Vijay Iyer. She performs her solo piece, Nine Doors at University of Massachusetts as part of the Magic Triangle Jazz Series. Welcome, Jen. I understand this is your first visit to Western Mass, so welcome yes. to our neighborhood. Thank you. Yeah. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah. I wanted to uh, begin uh, asking you a question about your past as an artist. Uh, you grew up dancing ballet and performing European classical music on piano and violin yep. and graduated from Stanford University mm -hmm. studying opera. Yep. So how and when did your interest in non-Western music and instruments develop? Yes, um, I think it was a slow kind of progression but um, so indeed while I was in the classical uh, kind of uh, world European classical music world I um, you know started getting interested in musical theater and and that was um, the first time I sang as well and I was very shy before I even um, sang so I, I feel like I went from being non-talking to singing. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but uh, so through musical theater, um, because so, so many of these show tunes um, were borrowed um, and kind of um, played with and interpreted by great jazz musicians, I, I kind of got through, you know, found jazz through Cole Porter and these, you know, shows um, uh, and Cy Coleman and um, so it was, it, it was really through theater, musical theater, and I definitely, uh, um, being on stage, singing and dancing and acting, you know, that was um, so attractive to me. And for a while, though, piano and violin were kind of that, you know, that kind of very traditional thing, like uh, competing, performing, and then musical theater was this separate dream. And so, it wasn't until I would say even let's see in college at Stanford I kept getting asked to to front for jazz combos like little ensembles and um, and so I would just kind of pretend to be a jazz singer <laughs> what I thought was um, you know with the dresses and the hair and the sultry looks you know <laughs> I thought that that was what a jazz singer should do so um, I kind of played that role through Stanford, you know, through my time at Stanford, while getting this degree in classical singing and uh, classical vocal performance. And then uh, I did the Stanford Jazz Workshop just after graduating. And I met some um, beautiful musicians from Cuba, because uh, at the time I was also so uh, obsessed with Afro-Cuban music. Mm -hmm. um, and having, you know, having also been studying Spanish throughout school and, and high school and college and and so Daphne Spreto and Yosvani Terry I got to meet at Stanford uh, Jazz Workshop and um, a friend of mine said hey let's go let's do this program called Plaza Cuba um, which was a Bay Area based um, program where you could you know pay a, a tuition and learn in uh, Escuela Nacional de Arte in Havana and and they would arrange everything and um, and so, and I was, I moved to San Francisco at the time um, and kind of picked up some day jobs <laughs> as uh, an intern for Other Minds Festival, was one of my day jobs. 
and and then I was um, kind of an assistant producer to uh, Tony Kelly of the that experimental theater company called Thick Description, and he had a theater. And so I had these two day jobs while I was singing with kind of a salsa band, and um, I met, but I think the crucial thing was meeting um, people from the community of the Asian, Asian improv arts world. And so Francis Wong, John Jang, um, Jenny Lim, Anthony Brown, <laughs> you know, these wonderful, um, people who are now dear mentors, um, they really, uh, you know, introduced me to doing, you know, quote unquote, jazz in in a different way and very very tied to your heritage and your ancestry and and I'd never never thought about that before. So it was definitely after college and in those three. I really think they were really formative years in San Francisco, um, working with Francis, Jimmy Biala, John Carlos Perea, Melody Takata, and Lenore Lee. So, you know, we had a collective that Jimmy and Lenora, you know, asked me to be part of called the Red Jade Collective. And I, I really feel that that was um, such an important um, kind of outlet for, for this idea of, um, not just multidisciplinary art making, but but multicultural art making, and um, just a really intimate, you know, becoming really close friends and sharing stories, and 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 you know, figuring out how to make those relationships um, something to offer to an audience. And so, yeah, that was um, that was when that first began. And Francis. Um, you know, then was encouraging me to uh, to start arranging these Taiwanese folk songs that I had photocopies of, <laughs> um, that I actually always had with me in at Stanford. And my dad gave gave me like a booklet of these photocopies stapled, and and it was my fourth grand auntie who had given them to my dad, and he, to give to me, so he gave that photocopy of those, like, I would say 15 songs of these famous Taiwanese folk songs from especially the 1910, 1920s, um, um, that era when Japan was you know, still occupying Taiwan. Um, and, you know, very sad and uh, full of longing. And um, So, yeah, I started to make arrangements and started to for my own band and um, you know, play with the melodies. But I realized, I soon realized that I was just doing it on a very surface level. And I, I, and I, I just knew that the dream began forming of going to Taiwan, connecting with these relatives I hadn't met yet, um, of my dad's. And, and then, um, you know, what are, where do these folk songs come from, you know? Uh, Beyond the paper, these photocopies, and and they were already already kind of arranged for piano and voice. So I'm like, well, there must be older stuff, you know, and and then so yeah, so Francis is really encouraging when I got this idea, and um, and he said something so important, uh, which was, yeah, I think you should just hang out. It'd be good to just hang out there. <laughs> um, so and around that time. I did meet Steve Coleman also, and and he, you know, coming from New York, uh, he was really the one to push me to, to, um, uh, you know, okay, if you want to go to Taiwan, just go to Taiwan. <laughs> if you want to move to New York, just move to New York. And um, so I did just that in 2003. I went to Taiwan, and and I went to Cuba uh, because after that Plaza Cuba experience, um, I found out about. A little about the, the the history of the Chinese laborers in Cuba and that how that migration happened, and um, so I went back the second time wanting to know more about that migration and, and just um, these you know, indentured laborer history, and then ended up creating you know a piece based off of that, and so I just did everything, <laughs> mm -hmm. 2003, and then um, at that time. You know, in San Francisco, I 
I just quit my job, I quit um, teaching, I broke my apartment lease. I was telling the students yesterday and just, yeah, moved, just moved all my stuff to my parents' house in Peoria and, or in Dunlap, Illinois, and then went to Taiwan. Um, and then later, soon after, moved to New York. And um, yeah, so that was, you know, singing in Steve's band was definitely a, like an apprenticeship and it allowed me to, you know, start forming my own band in New York and connecting with musicians there and kind of carrying on this idea of bringing my research and interest in, um, you know, starting from my heritage, but then I, I you know, chi China, East Timor, which is where my mom is from, and then just getting interested in like Korean pansori and also uh, in Indonesian, you know, Javanese gamelan singing and just kind of following these songs, especially female voices, um, you know, uh, just as, as old <laughs> of the songs that I could find. I wanted to, uh, indigenous music from Taiwan, um, for instance, and so it was just like wanting to trace that kind of singing with my voice and, 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 and be aware of how much that would teach me and, and how much these, these women, these elder women would teach me. So, mm. that's a uh, long answer. <laughs> yes, no, it's fascinating. And I wanted to ask you about your learning style. Mm. I mean, you speak uh, 10 languages, you mm. play many instruments, you, you're an ethnomusicologist, mm -hmm. uh, in effect. Um, do you have a system or approach uh, about learning? Do you have a, a way of going about it? Yeah, I think over time, um, I've gotten better at... I think what I learned, like early on when I first went to Taiwan, um, I, I, I was so shy, like I, I would record um, singers, but then I wouldn't ask them, well, what do the lyrics mean? Or I wouldn't, you know, there wouldn't be time to go over the lyrics because they kind of would improvise them anyway. Or um, So by the time I got to East Timor, I realized um, we need more days in each place or each village or with each family. Um, and so I would record it and then the next day uh, we would sit together with like, you know, the, the main, sometimes the, the leader of the group or the singing group and, and just play it back line by line. And he would, um, I would ha usually have a translator um, with me and, and we just transcribe, transcribe, transcribe. And then later I would translate know into English so um, so I got better about that about not being shy um, but I think across the board the approach first is humility <laughs> um, and and also gaining people's trust is really important um, and so yeah, it's like you have to not be shy but you also have to be patient <laughs> mm -hmm. and and you know, uh, I remember the very, one of the first wonderful, magical fieldwork experiences in Taiwan for me was, um, uh, I was there on a grant from Asian Cultural Council, and this was 2007, I want to say, and we were in um, Hualien, so the eastern part of Taiwan, and uh, I think it was like the border between Hualien and Taitung, um, and we were, I was taken there by um, a woman who supported, a Taiwanese woman who supported Asian Cultural Council, and she was really, she just loved music and dance as well. And so she took me there, and um, she knew uh, this Ame, Ame uh, group, an Ame tribe. She knew this particular family. And so, and she, you know, so generous, she would say, you know, she came all the way from America, her dad's Taiwanese, and um, she's a great singer, and she, she's looking for, you know, to learn songs, and did it. And, and, and it happened to be Christmas Day. It was Christmas Day, <laughs> and, and everyone was, luckily, everyone was already gathered because they were about to have a big lunch. And, uh, but of course, everyone was really shy, you know, and didn't want to do anything. So, so then she started to play this game, like, how about Jen sings a little song, and then you sing a song? And so we went back and forth, and... And I think 
they could sense, you know, I think I sang Summertime. <coughs> <laughs> it was mm -hmm. the first. And then they said, oh, okay, she sings. Okay, well, let's, you know. Uh, and then they just, like, one of the, the men um, just broke out into song. And, and, and then women were, of course, the shyest. So it was a, quite a few men who sang first, and then the women opened up. And then, um, and then finally there was uh, a man who... Um, he was also Ame, and, and he just kind of stood up and said, uh, you know, she came all the way from America, and, and uh, we need to show her her Taiwanese roots. And, and so then they, they actually enacted a festival, which usually happens July every year, even though it was December when we were there. And, and they got, you know, in the big circle where the elders sit in the middle, in, you know, in chairs, and then um, the younger people dance around in a circle. And... Um, so they actually dressed me and my friend, my Taiwanese friend, who's my guide, and their young uh, Da Niu was his nickname, Big Cow. <laughs> so one of the younger males um, from that clan. So they dressed us in traditional um, clothes, and then and then we just joined them in the dance, which were you know very simple um, foot movements, and then the singing. Um, but something like, you know, hoia, 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 and hawaiian, hoio, we, ha, ha, you know, and, and songs that uh, a lot of them just use hoias and heias. And um, so that was so beautiful. And mm -hmm. we spent all day celebrating. And, and then um, there was a, a blind singer who, who came, you know, and everyone was excited. Oh, it's Marason, it's Marason. And, um, he, Marason was apparently a great singer, uh, but his voice was more like uh, almost operatic. <laughs> and he knew a lot of these uh, old Japanese songs. So they all asked him, you know, oh, come sing. There's a, a young girl from New York, and she's, uh, her, she's Taiwanese, and, you know, you have to sing for her. And, um, and I just have on video this great moment when he's, like, listening to them talking. He's like, ah, oh, me, 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 me. He starts warming mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's like, me, 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 me. Um, but that was beautiful, and it just went on into the night until finally um, he, he said, oh, well, I'm going to be driven back to Taipei. Come with us, you know. And, uh, but then he was like, but first I have to stop by uh, my friend's house, you know. So let's, let's just fight. It means five minutes. Let's just fight. Five minutes we'll stop by. It turned into half an hour, and, you know, we were thinking, well, I don't know if he's ever going to leave. Like, so we did like three house visits. And he's just like, just five minutes. But it was like each like half an hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, we're never, we're never going to get out of here. <laughs> um, so finally, we took a bus. And, and he was still visiting with friends. But, um, you know, that, that phrase, just, just five minutes, it really, that is like the lesson um, that I've carried with me through life. Like, even if... You think that, oh, that place is, it's not worth going. We don't have enough time. You have five minutes, and that five minutes can plant a seed and, and, and you know, give you a future of, you know, a, a two-year path. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so many stories yeah, <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah. so fascinating. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about developing projects. How mm -hmm. do you go about uh, right. settling on a project? You have a number, you're performing Nine Doors, right. which... I assume took a while to sure. uh, conceive and yeah. perfect. How do you settle on a project? Yeah, um, I lately it's I feel like after Indonesia, um, so I was able to go to Indonesia on a Fulbright from 2011. Uh, I stayed out there till essentially 2014, um, but I went to Korea <laughs> for six months in that time, and I went to East Timor again and. Um, so the first project, you know, but I knew that, oh, I'm going to create a solo project. I kind of knew beforehand, yes, I'm going to create something solo out of this experience, you know, and, um, and I got to meet, um, this film director named Garin Nugroho from Indonesia, who's, uh, kind of a famous, um, he's like David Lynch of Indonesia, you know independent filmmaker, really, really ultra-creative, um, but he still kind of has a celebrity <laughs> status. Um, but I saw his film before I left. It was recommended 
to me by a friend, Jessica Kenny, who's a great vocalist, and she said, you should check out this film called Opera Jawa, directed by Garin. Um, it's like a beautiful combination of tradition and uh, um, contemporary, like avant-garde um, elements that I, when I did see it, I thought, oh, okay, I need to find this person <laughs> and work with him somehow. So um, when I first got to Indonesia, like September of 2011, I was on a mission. I thought, I'm going to meet, find this person. And um, I was able to meet him, I think, in December? Yeah, it was soon after, just through um, artists. And um, so, we, you know, I, I told him I was kind of very, what's the word, um, precocious or, you know, I said, yes, I'm looking for a director <laughs> for my solo work, which I had no idea what that work was. But, um, and he, I gave him my CDs when I had met him, and, and then he emailed back. He said, oh, I listen to all your music, watch all your videos. I'd be very happy to work with you. <laughs> and so, um, so from that point and through my time in Indonesia, we had conversations, we would meet. He saw a uh, solo performance I just put together that I performed in Jakarta, uh, in Salihara, and it was very much kind of like a precursor to what later became a piece that he did direct uh, called Solo Write Seven Breaths. And that I premiered right like right after soon after i got back um from indonesia in 2014 so um that project was you know that was born out of that really intensive time of research and learning i think i in that time i learned like four languages <laughs> in those like three years um you know or began to start learning and um and indonesian was definitely fluent by the time i i got out of um you know, or ended the Fulbright, and and then um, you know, I, I really kind of depend on life. I depend on life to show me the next um, project or, or or you know events that are happening. Um, soon after, it's actually just I premiered that in May. Just a few weeks after that premiere in 2014, I got an email a group email from the Gamelon um, world, like world list, basically, and stating that Sri Joko Raharjo Chilik uh, was killed in a car crash. And, you know, and, the, and this was a young man who was 30 at the time. I'd met him um, in 2011, you know, the beginning of my Fulbright, and brilliant um, Dalang, who is the, the puppeteer of the the tradition called Wayang Kulit, the shadow puppetry of Java, and and we had begun to collaborate, improvise. I learned a lot from him, and he wanted to learn. You know, he was learning about uh, jazz improvisation, you know, from me, and just you know, music from our scene, uh, our our friends. And he was just already an ambassador. Um, he did the One Beat program, um, which being on a can, uh, I think they sponsor them. And anyway, he was phenomenal. And and then learning about his death like that and um, that the devastation really just the grieving process led to um, Song of Silver Geese which led to Nine Doors the piece we'll be doing tonight and um, and that began I was telling the students last night it began as just like rituals that I I didn't feel like perform I almost didn't feel like performing solo rights, even though I had a lot of things booked um, for that. I, I felt like just improvising with Matt Maniri or <laughs> Ben Monder, and you're just musicians I love to just grieve and, and just, you know, um, yeah, and just kind of have a live ritual. And, and that did lead to Song of Silver Geese, which I built with um, Satoshi Haga, who's an amazing dancer. Um, and you know, along the way, we were very lucky to get um, commissions. Or uh, you know, Solo Right Seven Breaths uh, was possible because of roulette um, and uh, residency that they offered me. Um, and and then you know, Song of Silver Geese was possible because I applied for a Chamber Music America New Jazz Works grant and and got it. And so I was able to you know fund my musicians and and. Um, 
find rehearsal time with Satoshi, um, like through Exploring the Metropolis. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm very good at, if I have an idea, I'll just find the ways <laughs> to fund it. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the, that's how sh these ideas, these performances come about. Um, Zero Grasses, which I just premiered last week, um, like it's kind of third solo work, I guess. Um, it's kind of the opposite of Nine Doors, and I always try to do something the opposite of what I did before. Um, I think I was telling you that Zero Grasses was, mo it's mostly in English. It's not based a lot on, like not directly on traditional um, music that I've been studying. It's um, much, much more personal and just like my songwriting and um, and and dealing with very like current issues that I think me and a lot of women, especially women artists, are dealing with. Um, um, that being fertility and um, and also you know the Me Too stories that um, fall into gray areas that you know then so you know a lot of things that. Um, on dad passing away in, in April. So that's very much like right now um, um, that I, I wanted to to have a, a forum to to yeah, have those ideas shared and mm -hmm. and discussed. And it's funny after the premiere <coughs> of National Sawdust, um, the audience, um, you know, the very wonderful standing ovation they sat down and they they didn't move like they it's like they just wanted to talk so I said are you guys okay and we, and we just had this spontaneous Q&A like talk and chat and um, yeah so <laughs> well Jen I have a lot more questions but we'll yeah. have to have you back another time yeah. I wanted to ask you about women in jazz and sure. uh, we have voice collective oh, yes, and uh, yes. and you're teaching and educating so let's do it again let's do it again <laughs> okay thank you very much thank you glenn yes Yay.